I want to welcome people to the first of this year's ED series for BAPFOS. I want to, um, before I begin, I certainly want to acknowledge that we are all sitting on different lands. And for those in the Barwon region, um, acknowledge you're sitting on either Wadadurong, Goolagin or Gadabanood country. Um, I'm actually up on um, Barrambool land at the moment, and I'm assuming we know we've got people from far and wide. So acknowledging the various lands that we all sit on, that the land was never ceded, we acknowledge elders past, present and emerging. I also want to acknowledge the huge workload that Naomi and um, Foxy have done to pull these things together. They make they, they work like ducks. They make things look <coughs> pretty streamlined, but they pedal pretty hard to get it done. Um, today, I'm not going to speak too much at the start. We've got four topics in this series. This is the first of our topics. These are really short and sharp info sessions. So we're not, whilst they're going to give us amazing content, they're not big, long-winded things. So what we've done is we've actually got a school support board on our BatForce website. You will be sent a link to all the information we talk about today that information from this PD will be put into that backpack on the Trello board. So you'll get a link to that so you can follow up with further information. Um, so we want to acknowledge too that funding to um, ensure that you can watch this for free comes from School Focus Youth Services, which is actually state government funding. And the School Focus program has been run for BAT Force since its inception back probably 18, 19 years ago, probably even longer, actually. So if, I'm going to get started really quickly because Fiona has got so much wealth of information that she wants to share with us today. Uh, Fiona's been working as a facilitator that we've been engaging through BAT Force to work in schools. And just to give you a bit of context, over the last few years, Fiona's worked from with grade fives through to year tens for us, running programs in schools around hitting around regulation, census self, being brave. And I've of, often had to walk into a group of young people who've had Fiona as a facilitator. And to be honest, they're not that interested in me because they're still raving about the work Fiona's done with them. So welcome, Fiona. Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Lee. That's very kind. <laughs> and thanks for doing an early morning um, before school drop off to allow us to do this today. I'm going to now give you hosting duties, which means I'm going to have to ask you if that's okay to keep one eye on the um, people coming into the waiting room. Um, before we do that, do you want to just quickly do us a little bio rather than me go through it of your background just to let people know just while people are coming in? Absolutely. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I personally understand and resonate with the effort of sitting behind a screen at 7.30, especially if you've got little people in your house. So well done for getting up and, and getting here to engage in this workshop this morning. Um, as Lee said, my name's Fiona. I'm the founder and director of Talking Youth, um, a youth organisation where we devise and facilitate programs yeah. um, out in schools. I facilitate from grade five to year 10 through BAT force, but privately I work right through from grade prep to year 12. Uh, my background is in fact dance and movement therapy and it's my kind of connection to um, my my body and the way that I've used my body as a vessel and tool for communication and, um, that led me down the path of working with young just, people. What was that one? More than three years ago. Just be mindful, I guess we're all on mute, I think, folks, otherwise we're going to get lots of background, background noise and beatboxing happening. Um, so, yeah, working with young people for, for 20 plus years and recognising that um, I was supporting them beyond I just teaching them the skills of dance mm -hmm. or being able to understand how their body works and rather than mentoring them and supporting them and holding space for them. And that's what led me down the path of mind-body therapy and positive psychology and, and youth mentoring and, and starting to um, pull from all of my hats and create these, these programs that I truly wholeheartedly believe schools were lacking. And that was programs to develop self-awareness, to embrace who they are, to understand who they are, um, and to also understand their nervous system and what triggers them and how they can respond in a way that makes them feel more in control. Um, and so this work started kind of COVID year, to be honest, when we devised a whole host of programs online 
And then from there, I don't know, the rest is really history, I guess, folks, isn't it? I mean, I'm sometimes I'm up to 11 schools a week, um, both privately and through BAT Force. I've facilitated thousands and thousands and thousands of young people every day, every week for the past four years running these programs. And the outcomes have just been phenomenal. And um, I'm building beautiful connections with young people, but supporting them in building connections with themselves. And that inadvertently has increased engagement and their desire and want to go to school and to apply themselves Mm -hmm. at school on top of the fact that they've got tools in their toolkit now that can serve them well beyond their school years. So I'm really proud of the work that we do. I engage in some co-facilitators as well that come out to schools with me. Um, And I'm really excited to be here this morning and share kind of not just, you know, resource and knowledge that I've studied and learned, but what I see in the classrooms every single day with a whole host of different young people. Fantastic. And look, we're going to focus predominantly on regulation. Um, It's not going to be that structured regulation in the classroom right now. It's going to be child-centred and um, facilitator-centred. So I I suppose when I first started teaching, I can remember somebody saying to me, a child's job, just the um, um, that really moment that child's not there to give you a hard time they're giving you a hard time it means they're having a hard time so I kind of remember when I first started teaching that that's something that stayed in my brain um and when we talk about regulation and co-regulation that's why we want to bring Fiona in today so I've handed Fiona over the reins now off you go so you ready to start I am ready to start so again mindful that I'm letting people at the same time so I'll try my very best to make sure that I'm I'm focusing here coming forward, but good morning, everybody. Again, welcome to this workshop. So as Lee mentioned, our focus here this morning is on classroom strategies to enhance self and co-regulation and to increase student engagement. Um, And so what I will ask of you is there's um, a QR code in a couple of slides time. We won't watch the movie or the very short excerpt. It's only three minutes long here on this screen, but I will invite you to watch it post this workshop just because it gives such, it's a positive psychology resource and it gives such a concise and clear synopsis of what self and co-regulation in fact is and how it develops for human beings. And it's just a beautiful three-minute resource. To be honest, I'd almost share it in your classes if you're working with more senior age students. Okay, so here we go. First and foremost, uh, everything that I do, I give a little disclaimer at the end of and please take self-responsibility. So what I truly believe is that as facilitators and teachers and people that guide and support young people, it is absolutely paramount that we are integrating and implementing this resource. Can you put a kicker on? Actually, no, we're going to have to go, Alex. Because that, can I just be mindful of everybody, sorry to interrupt, can we just make sure everybody's on mute? Otherwise, we're getting some background noise and it might get a little confusing. Thank you so much. So, yeah, to, to ensure that we're integrating and implementing this in our own lives, because as we'll learn in a very short period of time, we cannot regulate or support co-regulation if we are not self-regulated. So unless these tools are something that we practice daily and then we contemplate and consider and have awareness around, we're going to find ourselves hitting against a brick wall constantly because our energy and our personal dysregulation is going to then impact the young people that are in our classrooms. So this workshop is going to ask you to be open and also connected to your own internal experience rather than just simply attaining external resource and concepts to apply to your students. And I ask the question why and the response is because the change actually starts here with all of us. It starts here with all of us. And when Lee made a beautiful little comment that she goes in and they often wonder where Fiona is because they've connected with me, I guess it's because I walk into the room taking absolute care that I am completely regulated and consistent and in a really good aware frame of mind and space in my body to be able to then hold space for these young people. And that's why I get the response that I get. That's why I get them connecting to me because they feel safe in my care. Now, I am absolutely not perfect and I make mistakes every single day because like you, I'm a human being, but that's really, really important to me in my programs. And I know that's what offers me the kind of the outcomes that I get. 
Okay, so here is um, this QR code. So maybe just pop your phones up at the moment and just scan this code and there'll be a YouTube link. As I said, don't watch it just now. There'll be plenty of resource that captures what this three minute video offers us, but it's such a beautiful resource for you to refer back to post this workshop, just to give you a deeper um, and more consolidated understanding of co and self regulation. Fiona, we'll, Fiona, we'll send a link, we'll embed a link to this video in the email we send out, it'll also be in the Trello. So if you don't have time to get it on now, you'll have it by probably the end of tomorrow. Amazing. Thanks, Lee. All right, so I'll move forward. So basically, regulation is our intentional adjustment to meet our needs. And we can't, in fact, self-regulate without any form of co-regulation, nor can we self-regulate without multiple, multiple experiences of co-regulation. So before I even talk through regulation, let's think about if those of you that perhaps have had children or been, been in, the, in the company of, of very, very small babies, I mean, first and foremost, they externally regulate because they have no tools and no ability to support themselves. So they rely wholeheartedly and completely on their caregiver or their support system to keep them warm, to feed them, to to hug them and nurture them and rock them to sleep and all those sorts of things. So that's where it starts. And if we go back to that, that initial stage of a newborn <laughs> baby, if those external regulators haven't been met as a three, four, six month old, then already this gorgeous little human is on the back foot of experiencing self-regulation because those external regulating experiences then transfer into co-regulation, which then transfers into self-regulation. So as you can see here, regulation is when we can create internal balance in the presence of external stresses. And as I say to beautiful students every single day, guys, stuff's going to arise all of the time. Sorry to break the bad news, but that is life. We are constantly going to be triggered, confronted, discombobulated due to life being life. And our job as human beings is to build the tools and the ability to be able to manage ourselves in and amongst all of these storms and the weather that presents itself every single day. So that is regulation. Co-regulation is the ability to regulate emotions and behaviours, manage stress, internal and external, and return to a calm state with the support and direction of a connecting person. So as this beautiful little baby experiences external regulation and their caregiver or support system constantly arrive and are there available consistently supporting them, feeding them, loving them, nurturing them, keeping them warm and safe. As they start to progress and get older into toddler phase, then caregiver and support system start to initiate and introduce co-regulating experiences. How can I help you regulate? How can I be here next to, you, next to you and support you in making a decision that feels good for you? Now, we need these over and over and over in order to even be able to contemplate self-regulation. So again, consider your classroom students. How many of your be beautiful young people have had multiple experiences in co-regulation? And if they have not, this in and of itself is going to deter them from being able to self-regulate. So I just want to give it context because when I walk into the rooms, I have to see these young people as whole people, not just purely in the parameters of the school classroom. What's happening to them outside of this classroom and what has happened prior to this moment outside of this classroom and how now is that impacting the way they're showing up for me in this moment? So progressing forward, self-regulation, therefore, is when over time and repetition, we internalise this co-regulation and are able to understand and manage our thoughts, feelings and behaviours. So our own thoughts, feelings and behaviours. 
So this is kind of the pyramid, if you like. So as you can see, self-regulation is right at the top of the tier. And I don't know about you, but I sometimes struggle to do it as well, you know, as a grown adult, access to all of this resource and knowledge. So it's, it's a big system that we're navigating here. This is a really, really huge topic. Okay, so for the visual learner, if we have a look here, as I mentioned briefly, we cannot co-regulate with somebody else if we are personally dysregulated. And it looks like this. A regulated adult and a regulated child obviously equals a regulated child. A regulated adult and a dysregulated child, fingers crossed, equals a regulated child. A dysregulated adult and a dysregulated child, we know what the outcome would be. And a dysregulated adult and a regulated child more often than not equals a dysregulated child. So no pressure, folks, <laughs> but as adults, it is out of utmost importance that we have the tools and the ability to regulate ourselves if we want to see success in our classrooms, supporting and regulating, supporting to co-regulate our students. And this is why, as I mentioned at the very start of this presentation the buck starts here like it's we are stop one um and it is confronting and and i know from you know embarking on my own education degree that you know there's not a huge amount of resource that and um and information that covers this topic when i was learning at university anyway you know so these are external skills that we really need to adopt in order to move forward and progress in the way that i guess education and learning is 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 developing okay so moving forward so what is dysregulation so now given what we know about regulation nervous system dysregulation is the inability to control or regulate one's responses. Now, it can look in a variety of ways. This can be emotional, whereby there is a lack of emotional awareness, understanding and acceptance of your emotions and an inability to cope. This can be autonomic. So this is where we're triggering the autonomic nervous system. And for those of you that saw my previous presentation, I spent a lot of time talking about the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, so the rest and digest, and the sympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight. So I've put the four Fs there, the flight response, the freeze response, the fight response, and the fawn response. And this is our autonomic nervous system. And when they kick in, that is our brain perceiving threat. That is when we've moved into hyperarousal or dysregulation. Affect, so it can look like inappropriate responses. A really common one here is laughing at a really sad or tragic event or when something scary happens. You get a laughing response. That's an effect dysregulation. Or behavioural, which I guess is, is something that I see every single day in the high schools, you know, young people embarking or not all young people, all people embarking on self-harm or destructive behaviour, addiction, um, being promiscuous, all those sort of things, so behavioural. Okay, why does dysregulation occur? When dysregulation occurs, we have been placed outside of our window of tolerance. So the balance between hyperarousal so heightened agitation, anger, and anxiety, or hypoarousal, which is a state of numbness, disassociation, and exhaustion. Prime example, I'm in a beautiful school yesterday. I'm working with their grade six students. I've had access to these beautiful young people for this is my second year, so I knew them as early grade fives, and I've come in for a swift six-week program this term to support regulation. It was so interesting now 12 months later to reconnect with these young people and recognise their different form of dysregulation. Last year, I couldn't get their bums on yoga mats. They were hyper aroused constantly. They were agitated. They wanted to play silent ball constantly. They wanted to move their bodies. This year, I can't get their heads out of their arms. They are exhausted they are disassociated and they are almost in a state of numbness where they're refusing to move their bodies i've been with them for two weeks now and i was talking to their classroom teacher that's had them for the both years now and just said wow look at how i mean obviously there's hormonal impacts and all that sort of stuff that have come into play but look at the difference now in their state of dysregulation 
you know, and this is where we get confused. This is all dysregulation, this inability to cope with external stresses. So I, I have my work cut out for me for the next four weeks in this program. Um, but that's just an example. So when we are in this state, it is our body responding to threat. Now, remember, our brain doesn't know what is actual threat and what's perceived threat. Yeah, the perceived threat is when we are in an experience that's familiar and evokes the same emotions as a previous experience that was threatening or scary. So this is where I guess your, your, your prevalent anxiety comes into place. This is us already anticipating something that's going to happen before it's even happened, which triggers our um, autonomic nervous system, which moves us into a state of of flight, fight, freeze, or fawn, so stress response. So this is why dysregulation happens. Now, keep in mind, this is a really um, consolidated presentation. There are so many other indicators and factors that contribute to dysregulation, like trauma and abuse and all that sort of stuff. I'm staying on the kind of the generalized um, aspect of what our young people are, but obviously there's much more severe severe um, conditions that you, I'm sure, are exposed to every day, and I certainly am. But this is kind of going on a more generalised. So just take note of that. Okay, so moving forward, what can we do? This is why you're all here. What can we do? Okay, Fiona, we get it. We've got all of these challenges. What can we do? Now, given the work that I do, I love the East and I love the West and I love the top down and I love the bottom up. I think that's why it makes me a bit of a jack of all trades. And I believe in both and both have a lot of merit. So the top down, there's many, many options. We can brain retrain. We can interrupt thought patterns. We can journal. We can EFT, which is emotional freedom technique, which is obviously something that would ha happen more often outside of a school environment. Or we can bottom up, we can have somatic presence in so we can actually connect to how we're feeling and how it feels in our body. I do a lot of this work. Orienting, um, so, so again, navigating sensations in our body in the grand scheme of things, so in reference to our current present experience. Somatic mindful movement, definitely my jam, breathing exercises, yoga, dance, sound, healing, and obviously energy medicine. So these are some of the things. Now I'm going to draw from a few of these in today's workshop that I really, really practice in my programs and support you in hopefully being able to practice them in your classrooms as well. First and foremost, what we need to do is stop. Now, what we don't incorporate in our lives often enough, this is a personal belief, see if you resonate or not, that's okay too, is find stillness and just stop. Because when we stop, we have the ability to create some space. And I call that magic space. That's what I tell my students. Let's stop and find some magic space. In that magic space, we can connect with ourselves Check in on our own zone of tolerance in that moment of conflict or dysregulation. What is happening for you? Folks, I sit across, so not only do I do these school programs, I have my own one-on-one -on -one private practice. And in school programs, absolutely, and in these one-on-one -on -one private um, client sessions, there are so many times that mid-exchange, I have to zoom in on my own internal experience and take absolute responsibility for it and check in to ensure I'm not projecting any of my own dysregulation, fears, anxieties, triggers to the exchange, both one-on-one -on -one and in my classrooms when I run these programs. Because our young people are sensitive and if you are dysregulated or heightened, you are extra sensitive. So they are going to react to your dysregulation so much more and it's going to trigger or extend, expand their personal dysregulation. So stop, first and foremost, even if it's for 12 seconds. Stop, check in on your own zone of tolerance. What bandwidth do I have today to cope with this? What is happening for me? And then with that resource, make a choice, yeah? Do I need to get help? Do I need to stop and pause this? Yeah, make a choice. Secondly, we need to stop, 
to check in on what we are observing, hearing and sensing. What do you or they need right now? And can you actually ask this question? So that is my first tip. Just stop and check in. This way we are hopefully responding rather than reacting. Now, it is inevitable that you are going to have dysregulated students or classes that are going to challenge your regulation. It's ine inevitable or trigger your, your own insecurities, your own wounds, your own pains. It's inevitable. It happens to me every single day. You know, a group of students not facing forward, listening to you, that wound of disrespect or lack of respect comes up and you just want to react to it. You want to defend yourself in that moment. And it's funny, I, um, I spend all day at a secondary college. In fact, that's where I'm heading to post this session. And I work year sevens, eight, two year eights, nines and tens. It's a very, very big day. And my year seven cohort that I've now had for about 11 weeks last week, they were really challenging me. And, you know, they're, they're incredible humans. I adore working with them. And, and they're not, you know, purposefully or consciously being disrespectful, but they were, they were quite dysregulated and they, they weren't really engaged and, and they didn't really want to give me any sort of attention or focus. And I felt what that was happening, what that was doing inside of me, you know, and suddenly some dialogue started ticking in my head, you know, for God's sake, like, you know, I have been here consistent, showing up in a calm, supportive way to these young people for 11 weeks, you know, and then I, they go and recess hits and I'm still there. They all want to talk to me. You know, I give, I give, I give, and they can't even make eye contact with me and hear me for these first five minutes. And I was, all this was happening in my head, you know, and I had to implement my own regulation tools in that moment. And I stopped and I stopped the room and I said, hey, team, I'm a human being too. And I love being here and I love working with you guys and we've made great progress and I'm grateful that you keep showing up for you and for this program every single week. But I'm trying to connect and talk to you right now and you're giving me nothing back. In fact, you're giving me the opposite. I'm looking at spines and backs of heads and I'm trying to temper loud giggles and, and re reactions. And I said, and this is making it hard for me to do what I'm here to do, which is connect with you all. You know, and they nearly fell off their chairs. And I said, and I'm not asking for an apology and I'm not, all I'm asking is for you to recognise how your behaviour right now is impacting someone that actually really cares about you and is here to help you, you know. And, and I did that and they kind of saw me as a human being and I saw me as a human being and I set a boundary and acknowledged my needs in that moment and they heard my boundary and acknowledged my needs in that moment. And that was important. That exchange was important and it'll be interesting to see how that plays out going forward, you know. So checking on you and checking on your students. Okay, moving forward. So here are some tools that I really, really love and that I apply in my programs every single day. So first and foremost, when someone is dysregulated, we're trying to avoid re reacting to their behaviours or talking to their behaviours because remembering that behaviour is a byproduct of the brain. So self-expression or slash and journaling is so powerful. And during this process, we ask these poignant questions. What am I feeling? Why am I feeling this way? What do I need right now? And how do or did my actions impact my outcome? Now, some of these questions are post-dysregulation um, reflections. Some of these questions can, in fact, happen in the moment. One of the best ones is, okay, I can see you're really frustrated and angry right now. What do you need? What do you need? What are you feeling? What is happening for you in your body right now? How can I help and support you? Now, I know this sounds really lovely when you're one-on-one -on -one with a student and this is less achievable when you've got 23 other young people to, to be mindful of in that experience. But this could be a post-reflection too where you come back to that student and you ask these questions and support them in understanding what was happening for them in that moment and what they might need going forward because they might not even know what they need. 
let alone have the ability, the courage, the tools, the dialogue to communicate that with us. Doing this in a journal way is so powerful. In fact, I call them brain dumps. I do it with my young people. Often, if I walk into a room, I read the room, they're scattered. There's a whole host of dysregulated energy. We have a talk. I connect. I'm like, right, books out, pens out. I pop on some poignant music, you know, music that I know is going to support the regulation process. I was like, brain dump. They look at me like I'm mad. Get it all out. What's happening inside of you? I don't know where to start. Let's use this prompt. Right now I'm. Right now I'm. And off they go. And I I no word of a lie. Some of them pull out four and five pages and they just go and they go. And then I'm like, right, shut the books. Let's put them away. We don't need to reflect. We don't, don't need to, you know, uh, you know, um, just, oh lost my words we don't need to kind of break it down and, and work it out we just we just need to get it out and I've done a little quote down here journaling is in fact a gateway into our subconscious and it helps to stop rumination and thought loops that keep us in sympathetic overdrive with the limbic system which is our responsive system that's firing off alarm signals so don't underestimate the power of journaling or getting it out. You know, it might be a beautiful thing to do at 2 o'clock post last break. You know, write out write out what happened in the yard for you. There might be some positive. Oh, yeah. you know. Okay, so that's journaling and self-expression. My next tool, I love this. I, I integrate this method always in my programs, fact over feeling. And this is a thought pattern interrupt. So I use this quote with my teams. If I can't change it, can I change the way that I think about it? And then I go, stop. Okay, you are reacting to this because it is triggering you. You are feeling fear. It is bringing up uncomfortable feelings in your belly and in your body. But what actually is happening right now? What are the facts of this situation? I know that it feels this way. But what are the facts of this inf of this experience? And yeah. this is where we're Sorry, thought that was my question. Does that, that make sense? So we are stopping that fault. Mindful to pop on mute, teams. Third one here, folks, is movement and voice timing is key. Um, I have a bit of an advantage just kind of in all my years of, of teaching dance and, and yoga and so forth in that I have and and, and being, a, 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 you know, both using my vocals and presenting and so forth, I have really, really more recently, probably in the past 12 months, taken so much note of my voice, my tone, the pace of the way in which I talk, the volume, and the outcomes are huge. And one of the most common feedbacks I get from young people, because they always want to come into my sessions and have a, have a carry on about this teacher or that teacher is, and they yell, Fiona, yeah. and they just talk so loud, you know. And, and I know from my own children, my nine-year-old particularly, if she moves into a state of hyperarousal or dysregulation, her ears become extremely sensitive, hypersensitive to the point where um, we have some really great ear inserts that dial down kind of the octave of, of sound, the volume of sound. And, um, and these young people, if they're constantly in this dysregulated state, they are so sensitive to sound. So if I can ensure that I'm using my voice in a way that is going to support, I'm doing it now for you all, that is going to support regulation, then that in and of itself is going to be a soothing element for their nervous system that is going to slowly but surely bring them down. So be so, so mindful of the voice. I mean, we, we need to. We need to raise it to talk over students. But the power of pulling our voice down of having no voice and not in a passive aggressive stern way but just embracing some silence in a moment of chaos you get response you absolutely get response so there's a little game follow the leader right the repetition is so good for the nervous system and for brain predict predictability you know for your young people everyone's a bit dysregulated get a little person standing at the front of the room it's like charades you know hands go up follow the hands 
TP, follow the TP. I don't know, follow the I don't know, fingers on the nose, follow fingers on the nose. So it's just starting to move their bodies, connecting back to their bodies and focusing on something away from the noise. Colour moves. So you, you um, label a colour. Yellow is slow, red is fast, green is um, low to the ground, blue is high to the sky, orange is big, green is small, yeah, and you yell out a colour, green, and everyone's moving in a really small way. Yellow, everyone's slow. So it's just, again, starting to use the body, yeah, and you could say um, or starting to use the body and connect in different ways to, again, distract from the dysregulated noise or the dysregulation that's happening in the body, hyper-focusing, but we're using our body, we're moving the energy. Sensory mindfulness. Remember that a beautiful way to engage in mindfulness is to focus in on one of our senses. What can I see? I'm about to do this tomorrow with a group of beautiful students at a school where I'm going to take them out for a stroll around their school grounds with their journals and we're going to find a beautiful spot and we're just going to listen and we're going to look and we're going to journal about what we see. Okay, now we're going to journal about what we hear. Okay, now we're going to journal about how it feels on our skin. Now we're going to journal about how it feels on the insides of our body. And these are just creating kind of interceptive skills, but also opportunities to regulate the body. Dance and yoga. I mean, this is not for everybody, but I can't tell you the power of movement in my workshops. Last week, I have two examples to share with you, and these are no word of a lie, and they were both profound. Both completely different as well. One, beautiful school I've worked at now for second term. Lots of trauma going on in that room. Um, lots of challenge, lots of dysregulation. I walk in, they are off the charts, absolutely off the charts. I have this big workshop prepared. I throw the lesson plan out the window. I put on some aerobic, if you like, music, and we did a workout for 10 minutes. And these kids had no idea because I hadn't danced with them yet that I could dance, you know, and they were blew, they blew their mind, but they moved their body. They got it out. They, they needed to be busy. They needed to get it out of their bodies. And then I brought them as the, the, the workout went from kind of this robust to, you know, mallowed, 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 to where I could sit them down on their seats and we could start engaging. And then the second school, and I remember calling Naomi post this school because I had such a breakthrough. These guys have been resisting movement and resistant to the idea of movement, you know, since I got them. Year eight students, um, lots of neurodiversity within the room. Um, don't switch off. You hear that through their dialogue and the busyness of their bodies, but predominantly through their dialogue. They're going 100 miles an hour. And um, we rolled out the yoga mats and I put on the music and we started moving. And they went from giggling and chaotic and they started coming in and I did some really restorative yoga poses and lots of balancing to bring in focus and awareness. And I bring, brought them down and down and down. I had them on their backs in lying meditation for seven minutes. Seven minutes. There were two staff members in the room that their jaws were down to their toes. And at the start of the session, I asked them what yoga was and they gave me all of the common responses to make body and mind calm, to build strength, blah, 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 blah. Valid, absolutely. And then at the end of the session, when I brought them back to their bodies from meditation, I said, hey, team, what's yoga? And one beautiful student, Carla, goes to me, it's when everything falls away and it goes quiet. And she had water in her eyes and she said Fiona that's the first time I felt peace in my head in ages you know and it was so moving and it was just like you know yes I, I co-regulated with you but you did that too and so I will do that with them now every week for 12 weeks because that consistent co-regulation is just another notch on their belt to support them in accessing self-regulation Stillness and silence, as I said, it's confronting. I know it's confronting when they're not responding, but if two out of 23 of your students can find three minutes of silence, it's done its job. 
It's impacted the nervous system in a positive way. It's given them access to access to a parasympathetic state, which is rest and digest. The more they experience that, the more the body will remember and be able to do that automatically. Remember the autonomic nervous system. So we want lots of opportunities to support and create co-regulation in our rooms because mm -hmm. that inadvertently is going to support self-regulation. And then the final one is breathing. Now, those of you that, that don't have a lot of understanding or awareness around breathing, breathe, belly breathing, diaphragmatic, diaphragmatic breathing stimulates the vagus nerve, which is the long nerve that runs at the back base of our neck and spine that directly correlates to the autonomic nervous system and tells our brain it's safe calm down, you're not in threat. So it stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. So in a PD last year with staff, one beautiful teacher said, okay, Fiona, you've given us all of this epic resource. What's the one tool I can take away? One that I can apply now. I said, start breathing with your friends, with your students and your friends. So start breathing with your students every day. Five breaths, diaphragmatic breathing, belly breathing in through the nose, belly expands, slow, steady exhale. It doesn't seem like much, but over time, it will stimulate that vagus nerve, which will automatically kick in in times of distress and dysregulation. There is a great breathing technique called VU, and it creates a vibration in the face, which really stimulates the vagus nerve and the nervous system. It's literally inhaling through the nose and then VU. You might even want to do it on mute. You'll feel a vibration through your lips and in the front of your facial, uh, facial lobe. And that stimulation, that vibration triggers vagus nerve, calms nervous system. Really, really powerful. So there you have it, folks. There are some strategies. Take a screenshot. No, no. Okay. So great strategies for young people. But I care about you guys just as much because I appreciate what you wake up and experience every single day. You guys are absolute superhumans, teachers, um, and I appreciate the, the stress and pressure you're all under and the way that you show up for your beautiful young people every day. So let me give you some strategies. Strategy number one is model regulation yourself. Remember that little spiel about my year sevens last week? Articulate your emotional experience and your choices during that experience. So it's okay, you know, obviously you don't want to go and pour your life story in on your on your students, but it's it's important for them to see you as human beings as well because for most students, they just see you as the teachers and those that have a negative interpretation or perspective of a teacher, they're going to put that hat on you and pop you in that bracket. Show them that you're a human being. When I say to my young people in these programs every single day, hey, what makes a great teacher? Trustworthy, connection kindness, caring. These are the things they want, you know, patience, support. These are the things they want. They want the human qualities that we all have. Sometimes in reactivity, we just forget to use them. So model regulation yourself and take a break when you need. I don't know how your school classrooms work, but I'm sure you can come together as a team and support each other in different ways or more creative ways if you need to take that break. Because I tell you what, if you feel your zone of tolerance decrease, you will not have the capacity to hold space for that group of students and get the outcome you desire or support them in co-regulation. You just won't. So, so be humble in that experience and take a break or articulate your emotional experience and your choices and set those boundaries. Environment is key. You know, remember you've got a group of 23, 25 students. Two might be dysregulated. The rest might be okay. But those two that are dysregulated have such a profound impact on the rest of the room. We know this, right? So first and foremost, provide a warm, safe, responsive environment where it is comfortable and safe to make mistakes. Remember, shame and guilt are such huge triggers for dysregulation huge triggers yeah so if you're consistently and consistently creating an environment where mistakes are welcomed where it's comfortable to be themselves 
and and show up even if they're not necessarily having the best day or the best version of themselves in that day then that is going to support co-regulate that's going to be co-regulating which is going to support self-regulation because it will be safe it will be safe and redirect inappropriate words or actions so that we're not impacting those 23 other students of the 25 that are really starting to feel the effects and impacts of the other two students that are dysregulated. And use your voice and body effectively. Stay calm where you can. I know it's hard. Stay calm, direct, and appropriately firm in your voice. And appropriately firm in your voice. Um, two years ago, worked all year with a beautiful group of Year 10 students, girls predominantly. Gorgeous, gorgeous group. Um, and one of them said to me, and I'll never forget this as a Year 10, I asked the question, you know, what what did you need when you were, you were younger that you didn't get that now you think back to and wish that you had access to? One of them said to me, boundaries boundaries she said if I had more boundaries then I wouldn't have such a vast parameter of what I can and can't do I would I would feel safer and now I find that because I didn't have access to those boundaries I struggled to implement boundaries for myself and with other people no one showed me what a boundary was no one gave me an experience of boundaries profound boundaries you know so you can do that you can implement those boundaries in a calm and direct and consistent and safe and kind and compassionate way yeah and come down to their level when appropriate this obviously is more applicable to the young students but come down meet them let them feel equal let them feel seen not looked over so come down drop the body okay and last slide here, folks. So this is a positive psych method template. It's brilliant. It's called self-regulated learning. And the quote here, this is Zimmerman, 2002. Self-regulated learning refers to the process a student engages in when she takes responsibility for her own learning and applies herself to academic success. And so what we're trying to achieve is autonomy, we're trying to support students in learning from their mistakes. And we're also supporting the students in questioning their beliefs around their learning. So it's a three-step process. So the first one is how can we support our students in gaining more autonomy in the planning stage? How can we support them in regulating their own and creating and planning their own tasks, set their own goals, outline their own strategies or schedules to tackle the tasks? So this is regulating their learning. So get them involved in the planning stage. And then moving on from there, the monitoring stage. How can you encourage students to put their plans into actions? Okay, let's go back to your plan. Now let's monitor it. Are you putting that plan into action? Are you monitoring performance? How are you going? What are you feeling? What's happening for you right now? What stopped you or, or made you disengage? What motivated you and got you to step three quicker than, than everyone's, you know, still at step one? So support them in monitoring. And the third and final stage is reflection. And this is where encouraging students to question their beliefs around their learning. Now, this model, I don't do it for learning. I do it for self, you know, awareness. So I would question their beliefs around themselves and how they show up in the world and what people perceive them. But for learning, it's reflecting on their own performance and questioning why they performed the way that they did. So what they're doing here is they're feeling and being exposed to an opportunity to have more control over their learning experience. And what this does, which I'm such an advocate for, is helps them develop some meaning and purpose. Because what they tell me all the time in these programs is they're disengaged because they don't care. doesn't mean anything. It's not relevant. They can't integrate it into their life, you know. So how can your lesson plans, how can your class classrooms support them in developing meaning and purpose by following these steps to be more self-regulated in the learning process? And I pop down here by taking initiative and regulating their own learning 
students gain deeper insight into how they learn and what works for them, which ultimately results in a higher level of performance and meaning and purpose. And that's so, so, so powerful because what I'm watching in all of these different schools and with all of these different ages and students is that, you know, different different to the way that perhaps I was a student in, in my days is they don't just show up and sit on the desks and face forward and do the work they're told, you know. They're questioning it. They're asking for the relevance of it and, and questioning the relevance of it in their own lives. They want a different environment. Their bodies are busier. They have more access to quick things at the touch of a fingertip. You know, our learning needs to shift and change to cater for what their needs are in that moment. So there's something just to support engagement in learning. So finally, my friends, I've got a few extra minutes here to hand over to some questions if you want to um, pop them in the chat box. But my final reflection is co-regulation is a precursor to self-regulation. If adults are deregulated, children learn to be dysregulated as well. So as I said at the very, very start of this presentation, change starts here with us. And what we've learned today, don't just integrate and implement it in your classrooms, integrate and implement it as parents and sisters and daughters and sons and friends and partners and wives and husbands, yeah? Integrate it into your own personal life because the more we practice it, the more we can teach it, the more we have compassion and resonance with the young person standing in front of us having a tough time. Because I tell you what, I can deal with that because I resonate. It's almost sometimes like I jump back into my 14-year-old self and I feel what they're feeling and I respond from that place, from that place of understanding and compassion and then add to that my level of expertise and experience. So I say it in all of my presentations, those of you that have ever have had access to me, it's like you got to connect in to radiate out. You got to connect in to make a difference and an impact outside of yourselves. So that would be my biggest invitation to you, um, everybody. So that concludes the presentation this morning. Um, this is oh, I'm not sure what happened there. I have this. Oh, there we go. That's all right. That's fine. Um, oh, did you jump back on Lee? Oh, that's what happened. You happened. <laughs> I jump back on because I, I suppose we, we, if you've got some questions, just have a second to think about a question. I'm really mindful some of you do need to get to class. There's a couple of things that really resonated for me. Like you, I do a lot of work working in schools and you said about a young person saying about the desperate need for boundaries. We're hearing that over and over from young people, especially in their tech space, that they, they're craving boundaries. So I suppose the other takeaway from me is it's one thing for a child to come to school and learn this and have an environment where they've got this at school. But as schools, how can we get information home to our families about the importance of co-regulation and practising that? And you said to for us as individuals to go away and practise it in our personal life because that's when we get better at it, to be able to do it in a classroom and in a stress situation is practising it in our personal lives. Is that one of the things we do off of that course is some parent carer sessions where we can take what Fiona's talked about and actually offer that up to parents and carers so they can get some of this information as well. So just keep that in mind for the schools we haven't worked with. Um, Fiona, I want to kick off the questions. Uh, you talked before about really important for people to hold their boundaries. And I think that that importance of two things can be true if a young person is kicking off and trying to find their regulation point that we still hold that boundary, but we don't need to win that fight. That sometimes I see in some of the environments I go into, they want to control the emotion to think you've had a win, that the emotion is just part of them getting to that point where they're finding their regulation point. And just your ideas on how important it is for two things to be true, that yes, we can hold our boundaries and yes, a young person could be having big emotions, but learning to sit with that is what you've talked about today. Um, you know, how important that is to teach our young teachers coming through and our young people working as they're coming into that industry that 
holding that, squashing the emotion is not going to work. So I suppose mm. I just wanted you to talk a little bit just quickly about that need to let have a safe space for that emotion to happen. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, this is, this is a relatively new space, Lee, you know. Like I don't know about you guys, but I certainly wasn't necessarily taught that all of my emotions were safe and valid. I wasn't offered tools <laughs> when I was a young person to, to necessarily manage them and, and control them. And I guess then we move forward as parents and teachers and so forth. And those big emotions, those scary emotions, they are confronting and they do trigger us and they do um, almost offer us a bit of a reactive response and for us to move into our own autonomic nervous system and have a fight or flight. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's part of the process, the emotional validation, expression and release is the step process to move us closer to regulation. So behaviour is a byproduct of the brain. We have to stop talking to the behaviour. We have to stop reacting to the behaviour. We need to start understanding what it's trying to tell us, its resource. And within that, we place the boundaries, we redirect it, but we don't for any reason suppress the emotional experience. What we teach our young people and our children is how is what's appropriate to in different environments you know what I mean hurting somebody else is never appropriate but if you have anger there you can get it out jam one of my grade six boys yesterday Fiona is it okay when I go get angry to go into my bedroom and punch my pillow with my door closed I was like when you're punching your pillow what are you feeling jam he said angry he said but if anyone saw me do that I would get in so much trouble I said he's punching your pillow hurting anybody he said, no. I said, how do you feel after punching your pillow? He said, karma and, and like I've had, like I've got my anger out. I said, well, that's a wonderful tool and you should be really proud of yourself for finding that tool yourself and, and releasing that. We don't punch other people, but if you need to get that anger out, you know. So in his environment, he's not allowed to show anger. It's frowned upon. So he has to hide it, but he's worked out. He has worked out how to do that in a safe way that's not going to harm anybody else. And that's him essentially self-regulating, which is so Absolutely. powerful. Yeah. Um, look, you'll notice I've put a quick survey up. We really need data from you to, A, guide us in the direction we need to go with these PDs. But at the same time, we have to report on this because it is a funded project. So while we're chatting, if oh, we'd really appreciate it if we can get as many of you as possible possible to fill out this quiz it just helps um, Kylie and Fiona and um, Naomi with reporting um, has anyone got any questions for Fiona she's got to buzz off really quickly soon so is anyone happy for you to take yourself off mute if you've got a question or pop it in the chat We're going to ask you to do three things at once. Listen, put things in the chat and fill out the survey. Let's try not to dysregulate them. Really. <laughs> if you work with young people, you'll kill that. That'll be fine. All right. One of, um, Fiona, I suppose while we're sort of coming up with some questions, one of the things that I've found when I'm working with students is when we talk about that respect or being mindful of, of other people is I sort of say to students at the end of a session, what's something you can do in another class today, show respect to a teacher. And just, it just feeds that thought. Okay. At some stage today, when I walk into another room and just that sense that if you make, you know, that allows that teacher to, to regulate too, if we're creating a really safe space for everybody. So as teachers, what we can do is, is teach their kids these skills of what to do. And sometimes it is just dropping a line before they go to the next class about what's something you can think about for the next class. And so just that reminder, because a lot of these tips are really great, but I know what it's like when you're running from class to class for some of you. It can be quite challenging to remember. Or even just writing yourself a list of two things each day to try and work into your day just to remind us 
and so it and I would even go a step further and this is what I I run a lot of values um workshops within my programs and you know what is respect what does respect mean for you what does it feel like to be respected how do you show respect to somebody else just to flesh it out a bit more so there's a deeper understanding of it and that might set off a light bulb moment where they're like oh yeah you know respect is way up there on my values list but I don't actually integrate it or offer it in my own life I don't give it but I expect it, you know, and that's just, again, building that self-awareness, what's meaningful and important to me. Okay. So then do I actually do that? Do I know it, but not apply it, you know, and, and that's really powerful dot to join. Uh, there's a, there, is a, there is a question. Oh, you got oh, it. Sorry. Sam. There is a question here. Um, what sort of programs do you recommend to use in schools to give teachers a guide to make these connections with students? Mm. Good question. So in regards to kind of, I won't label any specific programs, but I guess resource to lean into, um, there is so much free and available positive psychology resource that talks a lot about meaning and purpose and um regulation and autonomy and there's just so much out there available I mean I'm, I'm qualified in that space so I did a whole workshop um, a whole series on it but there's just so much resource out there and they just touch so much on how we can find more harmony um, between two people do you know what I mean and I think that's really supportive for teachers so I would definitely be leaning into some positive psychology resource um, but any anything personally that's going to evoke feeling an emotion in you and and ask of you to be more self-reflective do you know what I mean maybe you yourself can start journaling you know if you haven't if you haven't already done that you know so it's almost like implementing the strategies for your students in your own lives um, but in regards to specific programs I guess we could come back to you with some links on something that yeah. I feel I really resonate with um, well, but yeah that would well be Give us till the end of the week and we'll pop some links in the um, school's wellbeing support board um, around this. We just need a few days to get those links together because we've got them all. We just need to know which ones are probably going to be most appropriate. And you're all in different environments, really mindful. One of the questions, oh, the questions are beating me now. How does this work in with um, classrooms and complement work of respectful relationships and school-wide positive behaviours? I'll probably start with that one Faith that's all right um mm -hmm. I work I, I meet sort of fairly regularly with the um respectful relationships crew and I'm well aware of the um, positive behaviors the programs we run with the students which we engage Fiona to run have to align with the values of respectful relationships that's how we get them across the line to be run in schools and it's the same with school-wide positive behaviours. They're all part of a suite of services. So these are the, the small components that go to support respectful relationships. But we meet on a regular basis and talk about the themes that we're seeing um, because it's, it's a challenging environment when young people are going into school with no sense of self. So if they've got that, then they can start to engage in these programs and start to get a lot out of these programs. But we align very closely with those. Fiona, did you have anything else you want to add? Um, no, no, absolutely. Um, yeah, models are, I mean, obviously the private work that I do is a bit different, but, yeah, models are similar and all the same principles are followed, yeah. Yeah. Um, got one here that the staff who attended from St Joseph's Flexible Learning, which has just opened this year in Ballarat, I was talking to the Geelong crew yesterday. I'm going out to present there in a couple of weeks. Um, working with really disengaged young people who don't fit into mainstream schools. This work works really well with these young people. Um, I know I take elements of Fiona's work with me when I work and I'm about to go out and present at the Geelong campus on the 26th of August. So, yeah, for young people who haven't had that guidance on how to find that calm place, you do shorter, sharper versions of this, but eventually you get there. So wishing you all the best with the new school there. Um, somebody's going off to do some mindful breathing with the Year 11 mm -hmm. home group. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Lovely to hear. 
Yeah, look, we've got we've got surveys in from those who are here, um, who are left online, and we really appreciate people are jumping off because you're going to get to class. Look, we've got the next session. Um, I want to thank Fiona for her work on this. It's, as usual, there's always new bits of information for me, and I've seen Fiona present numerous times. Um, again, want to acknowledge the work that Naomi and Foxy have done to pull this off. Apologies to us, we will get a bit better with the technology and get on top of muting people. We're, we're getting there slowly but surely. We managed to get the poll online this week. That's a start. We're getting there. Um, look, have a look at our resources. You will receive an email with this. If you've got someone else you want to share this with, that would be great. We have our next session on August 27th. 27th. Now, whilst it's called the Impact of Nutrition, we are getting a whole heap, and I know Fiona is and I am from students, a whole heap of information back from students about some, you know, we call it disordered eating, but just around some of the information and misinformation these kids are getting on social media and how that is impacting on their learning. And it's actually an area we hadn't thought of, but also speaking to other professionals in the Barwon region, that this is actually a topic that is really important. So we will have a speaker on the 27th of August. And whilst it may not seem like a topic that is front of mind for everybody, I encourage you, if you do have the time to jump on and have a listen, because the, the nutrition, we know the impact of nutrition on learning and mental health, but also the messaging and the key messages and how we can combat that with our students is actually going to become really critical as, as Fiona and I both seen in our work. Um, Fiona, you need to go, so I'm going to let you jump off and go and present. If there's no more questions, um, I'm going to close this out. If you haven't had an opportunity to write where you're from or how many people are on your screen, please chuck that in the chat. And if you want to stay on and chat to us, you're more than welcome for, for the next two minutes. But I want to thank, on behalf of everyone, thank Fiona. Kylie, Naomi, have you got anything on this? Cheers. Bye-bye. Enjoy your day, everyone.